uh, there's a lot of you that signed up that, that aren't able to make these time zones. So, uh, so it's really important that we sort of save, uh, the, the, well, we enable others to, to have the experience as well. Um, what we want to do with these uh, learning spaces uh, is really to be able to share what we're not finished with yet. Um, works in progress, unfinished thoughts, uh, not with thought through ideas, uh, questions, challenges we may have, particularly when we are trying something bold, particularly when we're trying to change something that's really difficult. Uh, and in this case, uh, changing uh, the practice of public policy certainly seems certainly difficult enough. Um, and I think, I mean, looking back at the, at the past couple of days, uh, you know, we've been trying to in a way, zoom in on different building blocks of institutional innovation. Um, and we talked about everything from public procurement and funding and, and how we spent money to yesterday evening talking about social R&D ecosystems, uh, over talking about how we build learning organizations, uh, zooming in on the future of innovation labs. Um, and I think um, all the way through, uh, and I think it's very, really relevant for this conversation, is that it, it comes down to, um, in a way, uh, you know, government ownership, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, government ownership, government leadership. Um, and I think one manifestation of how governments are taking ownership of, let's say, transitioning into a new ways of working that probably deal more effectively, more realistically with the world, uh, the context we're in, um, is to look at policy and how how this that practice is changing and, and therefore i think we are de really delighted to be joined by albert miko and thea today each from their organizations and in their professional journey have made it their uh, primary profession i'd say uh, to not just rethink policy but actually experiment with new ways of doing it um so i'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from from all of you and to this conversation um and uh we will do we will follow a bit of an order where miko is going to kick up kick us off with a with a bit of a scene setting on their recent work on humble government uh, and then uh, he's going to be followed up by albert and, and Thea, uh, and then we'll we'll join the conversation but i'll encourage all of you from the get-go to share questions or thoughts in the chat uh, and we'll try to uh, come to them uh, during uh, during this session so but yeah, thank you all for coming and uh, over to you, Miko. Thank you, Jesper. Let me just share my screen quickly. You can screen see my screen now, right? Yes, okay. Uh, hello everyone and, and many thanks Jesper for, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I think the topic is very important and at least close to my heart. So, so very, very big pleasure to be part of this event. Uh, my name is Mikko Annala. I lead Demos Helsinki's governance innovation portfolio, um, which means that um, we, are, we are the team that is uh, basically dedicated itself to work together with governments and try to come up with concrete codified uh, new operational models, which would help governments to to better fulfill uh, their job uh, and, and, and do a better job in 21st century. Um, our analysis has been that uh, more transformative governance is needed. Governments need to be able to steer us through these necessary transformations that are already ongoing in societies. And this is one, one governance model, uh, which is actually a policymaking model that we have been very recently working in Finland. So one year ago, uh, Finnish Prime Minister's office uh, asked us to work on the future of government steering. They basically asked what would be, what, is the, what are the new mechanisms and new, uh, new tools for governments to steer societies. And together with the Prime Minister's office and also Ministry of Finance, uh, we came up with a model called humble government. Essentially, it's a shift uh, towards a government that is not trying to say that we know everything and we know how to go about it and we know the solutions, but a government that is uh, humble and essentially is able to say that we have limitations, we don't know everything, but we are going to find out and then becomes a stronger government um, because it's able to learn, learn faster and be better. It sounds 
um, idealistic, uh, but let's see if I can in the next 10 minutes to convince you that it can, it can be a reality as well. But let's first start uh, from the question why. So why do we think something like this and, and, and overall new kind of policy making is needed in societies? So my job is to work with different governments. Um, right now, we, for example, have 16 or 17 projects ongoing in 10 different countries. And the challenges that we face in these very different contexts are actually pretty similar. Um, and we have interpreted that a big part of that is basically because the governance systems that different societies, different governments have inherited, have been inherited from the industrial times. And what we inherited from there are, uh, for example, principles such, uh, such as governments trying to have quite a lot of control over things that are happening, governments trying to have a lot of clarity in their processes, governments having presumptions of strong hierarchies uh, still making a lot of sense, uh, and governments willing to have or thinking that they can have quite a bit of power on things that are happening in societies. And right now the landscape is still, it has changed quite a bit. Um, power has been dissolving to ecosystems. You have more and more complex problems ahead of you, in front of you, and you have more and more rapidly changing society in front of you. Which means in, in a nutshell, uh, that basically these processes that we inherited from the earlier times, they still work in many instances, but then there are more and more growing amount of situations where they don't serve us as well as they used to be. So that's why there's, there's a fundamental need to rethink some of the core of government processes and functions that are in there. Well, <clears throat> coming down to the Finnish context where we worked with the Prime Minister's office on this project, um, actually, uh, to those of you who haven't been working in Finland and don't know the context that well, I have to, in a way, emphasize that Finland is not the bad student in the class. Finland has been actually doing quite a bit of things on developing public, public governance. Just to highlight a few activities, we've had two quite recent governance reforms, steering reforms, uh, fundamental reforms within the last 10 or 12 years, Ohra and, 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 and uh, Pakuri, which you can find in English online if you like to know, know more about them. We have governments shifting from detailed government programs to strategic government programs. Over the last government term, the prime minister established uh, experimentation as a horizontal item to the government program, which is still alive, well, even though the, the next government is politically very different than the previous one. We have national foresight system that is globally well known, and for example, Citra, that is one of the oldest uh, innovation labs uh, globally, uh, has been functioning over 50 years in Finland. So there's a lot of stuff that has been already done in Finland and, and, and development is continuous. But still, and what's perhaps more interesting uh, is that the current government, uh, led by uh, Prime Minister Marin, has said it explicitly that this is not enough. We need to take this more seriously. And, and on pretty much on the top of the current government's political agenda, government program, there, um, there's a chapter basically about reforming political culture and decision making. And it has taken a form of four pledges, um, which are these that you can see on the screen right now. So for example, the first pledge is a pledge for continuous learning in government. And government saying explicitly that we do not imagine that we know in advance what will happen, but look, we will go, we will figure it out, we will test, we will experiment, uh, we will learn from that. There are other pledges as well, which are equally interesting, pledge for a new kind of interaction between government and the rest of the society, and also horizontally within the government, pledge for long-term policymaking and pledge for knowledge-based policymaking. So political will is there, and this is the second consequent government showing a strong emphasis on, on renewing and reimagining the governance quite boldly. Why is this then? Well, my interpretation is that it is because of government actually having pretty, pretty transformative uh, objectives on its agenda. These are some of the uh, objectives that you can see on the government program. So the government is speaking about strengthening democracy, rethinking participation and strengthening trust between, between the government and, and people and different institutions. They are talking about halting the decline of biodiversity in Finland, about moving towards a paradigm of long, lifelong learning, 
Um, there are quite ambitious employment related targets as well. And perhaps most importantly, Finland trying to achieve carbon neutrality by 35, uh, which is, to my knowledge, one of the most ambitious national level targets that are out there. So transformative topics, transformative objectives are out there, um, but, but there are actually very few concrete pathways how to actually achieve that. Um, during the project that we did with the Prime Minister's office, um, there was a phase where, um, where we investigated, uh, the consortium investigated governance bottlenecks. Um, and these were basically the fi findings in a very, very nutshell version. So what is, what is hindering government's ability to move towards these kind of objectives? First of all, uh, culture of infallibility. So our go government still feels it needs to show that it knows the solutions and it can't really go towards directions that would be uh, more risky, would be more out of the box and so forth. And at the same time, we know that sometimes the best solutions are exactly out there. Second, lack, lack of systemicity, scattered knowledge base, silos. So like everywhere else, there are strong public administ like administrative boundaries within public administration. They work really well in certain kinds of situations, certain kinds of policy domains, certain kinds of policy objectives. But then quite many of these topics that you see on the left side, they are horizontal by nature, they require long-term attention and so forth. So in these situations, government has less tools to work well. Thirdly, institutional short-termism, there's a number of reasons which drive the government to pay more attention to short-term than to those problems that would require long-term attention. And you can imagine a number of them. Some of the reasons are psychological, some of them are organizational, some of them are institutional, but these are out there. So <clears throat> we tried to tackle from our small part some of these problems and we came up with a suggestion that we call humble approach humble government so this is how we on a high level of abstraction want to go there so culture of infallibility for that we suggest humble problem solving where government acknowledges that it doesn't hold all the answers then lack of systemicity we suggest humble collaboration which means that government trusts people with the mandate to find solutions to the issues that are close to them Thirdly, short-termism, we propose humble politics. It means that the government is willing to collaborate with those that it disagrees with and also shares the spotlight with them once it succeeds. Well, of course, easier said than done. Um, so we wanted to go deeper than this and we actually codified an approach and that is quite well documented in a publication of ours. And here is a quick version of it. How could this then be integrated in the national policymaking system? So four steps. <clears throat> First one, uh, thin consensus. So you don't actually uh, try as a politician to solve everything on the, on the planning table, but you agree on a thin consensus, meaning a direction, a framework goal, which all political parties, or at least big majority of parties, can agree on. For example, climate targets in Finland is one example of this. Importance of education could be another one. Then you move forward towards the learning process and you incentivize local stakeholders to problem solving. So assumption here is that quite often organizations that are on a local level closer to the implementation know already quite well how some of the challenges can be solved. So you incentivize them to be on board systematically, disincentivize the, uh, if some, some of them don't want to be on board of, board, board of your problem solving process and give them a strong mandate, uh, autonomy, to try out innovative practice. Then thirdly, peer learning mechanisms. So essentially, experimentation doesn't really help if you don't learn from that. But instead of immediate up, top-down uh, type of uh, reporting, uh, we, we encourage uh, peer learning, put into place structures and processes that help these stakeholders to learn from each other. And finally, this is the moment of humility. Politicians need to come together and they need to learn what, 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 in which, which, which ones they were wrong and where they learned about through these experiments and then integrate that learning into their framework goals. And if needed, depending on a policy goal, depending on a situation, run this system all over again. 
What's great about the approach or interviewing is that we kind of know it works. Uh, we did this together with um, Professor Charles F. Chabel uh, from Columbia University, who's been mastering the approach of experimental governance. And he's been studying a number of cases that where governments have been organically using these four steps to come up with pretty great results. Here are a few concrete examples. Uh, the Finnish education system uh, is pretty much based on these four steps. And then on the other hand, on the global governance side or international, the collaboration side, Montreal Protocol uh, is the most celebrated climate agreement globally. Uh, it, it follows pretty much these four different steps. But at the same time, no one has institutionalized this approach. No government uses humble approach, humble policy making anywhere. So we wanted to start seeing if that would be possible. And we did an operationalization of that to the Finnish government context. But also, we also wanted to see if that would be, it would be possible to start advocating for more political attention and more political demand for this approach. Um, oh, sorry, by the way, this is the Finnish education system. Uh, just to run it through you quickly, uh, give you an example how, how this runs in practice. So how Finnish education system works is essentially that uh, framework goals are defined in a national curriculum. So we have a national curriculum that is revised periodically. And we, that gives a broad direction of what we want to achieve with education. But secondly, how it's implemented is very much about the local stakeholders. We have a strong municipal autonomy and we even have a strong autonomy for schools, even for individual teachers. That means that they have a lot to say on how they implement it and how they interpret uh, these goals uh, in their surroundings. Thirdly, there is a government is uh, putting uh, funding and putting uh, stakes in enabling peer learning. So there are structures and processes that do that systematically. And fourthly, every now and then, every some years, all these learnings are taken to national education agency, which then take that up to the ministry, which uh, updates the national curriculum. And again, the vehicle goes around and around. And that's how the system stays alive. So coming back to, back to my, uh, my topic on institutionalization of this, no one has done that. And this is, would be a very cool to go through this and talk, talk through it with you today as well. Is it possible and how would it be possible? But to uh, start the discussion, we put together this publication, which is directed to the heads of states. And here we want to give some direction that if you happen to be a prime minister or heads of state and you're interested of humble approach, how can you get started? So it's a bit of a cookbook. Um, but more serial, on a serious note, it includes a pretty nitty-gritty uh, codified approach on how to run this approach in a, as a part of your policy making system. But I will stop here. Uh, thank you for listening and curious to hear the colleagues and, and mm -hmm. questions from, from you. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. Uh, that was a that was a great uh, scene setter for this conversation, I think, and, and um, always nice with the with the with the right level of ambition from the get-go. So, uh, so appreciate it. I'm sure we will get into the, the conversation about it. I uh, certainly have a range of questions already lined up. Uh, Albert, uh, do you want to pick off uh, from what Miko left off here and, and share some of your experiences uh, at IGL and, and maybe beyond that as well? Sounds good. Let's see if I can uh, share the screen. With Google Docs, you always you never know. Now I think it's working. Hopefully you can see the screen. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, I, I really like enough Nico's presentation, humble government, and some of the things, I mean, we don't cover everything that, you know, he was touching on, but some of the things that uh, he was talking about um, are quite uh, quite familiar kind of things that we've been doing or thinking about. The, I guess, on the question, I guess, you know, the, the high level question on the future of public policy, uh, you know, IGL focus is that uh, the public, you know, the future of public policy means being experimental. I think even the people I've seen on the call today, not, there is not much convincing that needs you know, to be done on, on that. The challenge is how to how to get there. Uh, maybe just a very for those of you that know, just a very quick intro on what what IGL is and why it was set up. I mean, our focus is on trying to make uh, you know policy experimentation normal. Uh, and doing that particularly on a, on, on a policy area where there hasn't been much structured experimentation, such as uh, in particular innovation policy, industrial policy, productivity policies, and business support programs, and 
and so on. Uh, I, I know I am always somewhat uh, impressed of how uh, you know, and I find it puzzling that the policies that are supposed to be used to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship tend to be not very innovative and not very entrepreneurial. So part of the aims of over here is to change that and you know, doing that in, in, in very different uh, ways. We structured our work, and I guess going back to you know, the, the concept of kind of peer learning as a community, a community of organizations, governments around the world who want to be more experimental, as a community of researchers around the world who want to actually help create new knowledge. And, um, and basically our role is to try to bring those two worlds. So one of our roles is to try to bring those two roles together. And we do this through many different ways, but probably just conscious of time, I'm not going to go through the work that we've done. The slide is here. If you are kind of watching the video and you want to pause, uh, and rather I'll focus on uh, why we like experiments and why we think experiments are part of the future of public policy. And I guess the, we always think of experimentation from kind of two different lenses. And uh, we've had some, some, some debates with all Nesta colleagues in the past as well on you know, which of those lenses and you know, what, what's the right balance between those. Part of the experimentation and the beauty of experimentation is encouraging kind of new ideas. Uh, and the reason for that, you know, as ben, and, and Nico was mentioning, you know, there are a lot of you know, challenges. Typically, governments have little space to think out of the box about how to address those. And we think experimentation is a way of helping them think out of the box. But then also uh, uh, as a way of improving the, the evidence base in this space. I mean, if you look at European countries altogether, they spend something like uh, 150 billion euro every year in programs to support uh, innovate, you know, businesses to innovate and grow. And um, there is very little evidence on you know, what, whether, you know, what, whether it's working or, or not. Albert, just before yeah. you continue, uh, there's, there's mentioning that your mic is touching your sweater. Uh, so it's just sort of disrupting the no noise. A little oh, sorry, bit. apologies about that. That's yeah, all right. That, uh, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let me you might have to button way. down a little bit. So uh. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let me, let's give it a try. Uh, is it okay now? Hello. Yeah, I think so. Let's see. Okay. Let's. Otherwise, I'll interrupt you again. Okay. Sorry. Was, yeah, sorry about that. So the one of the things that we've seen in the last few years. Well, you know, we've been at it for I think it's like almost like four, you know, seven, eight years now is how the word experimentation has become normal uh, and how lots of governments are starting to you know, use the word experimentation, which before uh, in the kind of policy documents. One of the challenges, however, that we see is how this word is actually, what people mean by this word. And here, uh, you know, what very often you see governments saying, we have to be experimental, we are experimenting all the time, we are trying all these new things. But our understanding of what an experiment is, and I guess that's basically what you know, an English dictionary uh, definition would be, is that it's actually testing something. So testing, you know, trying to discover something, trying to understand where something works. And that means putting learning as the priority, being intentional in how you're going to learn and have some specific timeframes on how you're going to, to, to achieve that, uh, uh, that objective. I'm gonna do it again, Albert. Uh, maybe, you hold, maybe, maybe you can hold. Maybe maybe you can just hold. Let me hold the mic. Let me do a. Is this better? Sorry, one second. Is this better? Yeah, I think so. Okay. okay. Sorry about Thank that. You. Apologies. Uh, so the, I guess moving on more on you know, how are kind of what is the approach that we're trying to encourage and how are we kind of trying to help governments to be more experimental? I would say. Uh, we're trying guess, to, to, and we're doing lots of different things from capacity building, from kind of uh, awareness rising, from one-to-one -one support. But typically, the, the kind of the two things that we are seeing that kind of sort of uh, start kind of work at making, you know, building the system to be more experimental in this policy space. One is this idea of creating experimentation funds, you know, and lock funding mechanisms to create the incentives for frontline organizations to be experimental. The other one is to try to change the, the internal culture of governments, uh, uh, you know, to be more experimental. And that means, you know, having the right incentives, the structures, culture, skill sets, and, and, and so on. When we're thinking about what are kind of the things that are needed or uh, I don't know, what do we, uh, in organizations, and, and when we think about experimentation, there is something about the mindset. You know, and the what if question actually, you know, like borrowed from you know, the work that the state of change and the skills team has done over the, you know, uh, the last you know, many years. And I think it's a very nice framing you know, getting people to think about what if. 
there is something else about uh, creating the culture where actually the people who kind of are thinking what if can go and test it and there is openness to failure and then there is i guess saying as well something about the methods and uh, um, uh, how you actually learn which approaches you use and i would say that in all these kind of three i guess pillars they mentioned call it whatever you you want there is still lots of work to be done uh, to get to you know to, to get governments to be experimental the when we've talked to you know, the governments we work with, we typically see that they fall into kind of different categories, uh, uh, both when we're thinking about kind of their openness to be experimental, but also their in-house capabilities. And one of the things that it's kind of quite, uh, sometimes where I find it you know, interesting is that those two are not necessarily correlated. So you have some governments that are really open to the idea of experimentation, really want to do it, uh, but uh, don't really have the capabilities. And you have governments that could do it if they wanted to, but there is some kind of almost an ideological uh, uh, reluctance to, to engage in, in that process. The other, I guess, one of the lessons we've, we've learned uh, in the process, and when we started uh, IGL you know, uh, seven years ago, was that it's important to ensure you know you do the kind of the full I guess the full journey of experimentation properly. So very when we started you know I guess on the spirit of you know sharing you know work in progress and what didn't work, lots of our focus was very much on let's just test solutions and let's ensure that we test them in a way that we will be evident. So a focus on trials, a focus on RCTs. The one of the realizations was that very often the things that were being tested probably needed, didn't need to be tested. Uh, because it was the wrong solution. So you know, without testing them on the field, it was, I mean, with a little bit more kind of design work up front, you would have come out with a very different thing. So part of the journey that we've been, and we almost encourage kind of the governments to be is, uh, it's fine to test things. It's important to test things, but it's, in, it's important to ensure that what you are testing actually, you know, uh, 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 is that, I mean, it's potentially the right solution. And sometimes you don't even need to test to, you know, to get to, to get at that. Uh, just to kind of just move maybe to to to, to some of the, you know, the some one of the second ideas that we kind of been pushing. So what I was talking about was more about you know getting governments in the house to be more experimental, and we would spend like hours discussing about this. But the other one is we believe, and that links to I guess the idea of humble government, that the best program ideas to address you know, most of the policy challenges in our case, you know, productivity, innovation policy, and so on are unlikely to come from inside a meeting in a government ministry. That doesn't make me very popular, maybe when I talk to governments, uh, but uh, our belief is that there are a lot of things out there that are interesting that are happening that uh, could you know, would be worth to scale up, but the challenge and the policy challenge is that there is no mechanism typically for uh, governments and funders to distinguish which are well-intentioned but ultimately ineffective efforts from which are those that really are impactful, interesting, and uh, would, be, uh, would be worth scaling up. And this idea of experimentation funds that we haven't invented is something that other people have, have, you know, have been applying in other fields that we've kind of taken into, into the field of kind of productivity and innovation policy is one way of identifying uh, new ideas and encouraging new ideas. Uh, it's one way of kind of getting more organizations to be experimental and you know encouraging them to actually test and giving them the space to fail, uh, to try it and fail. And ultimately, we almost kind of see it as a way of empowering the change, uh, you know, the change makers in organizations in the ecosystem to be able to uh, legitimize, you know, to give them, I guess, some some additional ammunition or some additional arguments and uh, to legitimize the idea of running experiments and uh, give them some support by getting them the funding that they can then use to convince their colleagues to go and, uh, and set up experiments. Uh, no, we've been working, uh, we've been partnering with both the government and the European Commission on um, two experimental funding calls, but there are many other examples also that are applied to other policy areas that I think people can learn from. Just to finish uh, on you know, some kind of, I guess, personal reflections on, on the journey. Uh, and this is sorry that it's a text heavy uh, uh, slide, uh, but just you know, to ensure you don't forget some of them. Uh, in the 
part of us, I mean, we are part of our kind of role is yeah, to try to change. I mean, our ambition has been to try to change policy making this space to make it more experimental. And that's, uh, and you know, our geographical boundaries is basically, I guess, advanced and emerging economies. So it's not for, for a small team of you know, 11, 12 people, that's quite an ambitious agenda. I think uh, it's important you know, to be ambitious, but it also to be realistic on you know, what you are going to achieve in the short term, otherwise there is a risk of being frustrated very quickly. Uh, one of the things that, that also applies to governments that want to be experimental, uh, there is sometimes when we talk to governments and they sort of say, we're going to run the, kind of, the most kind of larger scale experiment. We really buy it. Let's do set up a very large scale experiments. Uh, the, the challenge is that very often when we've seen that is that typically the experiment has never happened. It was too ambitious for the capabilities and the political will and the organizational will to implement them. So sometimes starting a small uh, build and, you know, and using those small successes to build a large coalition can be a, a useful way of achieving that. Uh, one thing I've already mentioned is you know, the importance of being flexible uh, and, you know, on how you, you do it. Maybe the last you know, couple of ones is, while I see much of what AGL work is about is empowering individual champions in organizations to you know, change them and giving them external support. Uh, relying only on them is risky. And the question is, and the challenge, and that's one of the areas where I say it's a challenge that we haven't cracked yet, is how to build wider okay, yes, coalitions of change and internal champions in internal organizations so that change happens. I actually think a set of change is an example of doing that through know, the programs that, you know, that, that, that kind of you've been, you've been running. Maybe a couple uh, uh, ones to finish. The, this is not a bottom-up or a top-down exercise. You need both. Uh, and if you only have one, you know, not much progress will happen. And maybe one, you know, one reflection about us uh, uh, and one of the challenges we face is we are an outsider in the process. I guess as Miko, you are as well. Uh, but for, and that has advantages. I mean, we work with lots of government around the world. We have the advantage of seeing what they are doing. We are learning from them. We can encourage peer learning. Uh, uh, but that also means that we are much less ingrained in the inside of policy making. And very often what we see is that ideas that come from us or from, you know, even sometimes you kind know, of some inside organizations that are still sitting relatively on the margins of you know, the, the standard policy making is the ideas are great, but there is, um, there is a limited rate, I mean, but, but the success in translating those ideas and those concepts into actual policies on the ground becomes much more challenging to achieve. So how to, how to manage those, this tension is one of the challenges one. So last point I mean, I think what we're all trying to do and probably is not easy, it's difficult, but then basically to change how governments work uh and you know going back i guess to with real expectations there will be and there have been and we've had many uh, failed attempts at this but whenever you succeed and you know, there are successes successes as well uh they cannot make it overall worth it and i think i'll i'll finish here thank you uh, thank you albert um and uh, apologies for the interruptions uh, um but um that was that was a, a great kind of power through of, of, uh, of your work and, and some of your reflections. Um, uh, I think there is a, a sort of a, a looming question there about cultural change in, in terms of how uh, maybe, um, maybe kind of um, in a way, how can we break that down a little bit? What, is our, what are actually the components of that? What are the acupuncture points? That we need to be thinking about in, in kind of facilitating or be, being parts of culture change. But, but let's let's return to that, and and maybe I would actually assume that Thea will be talking about aspects of that in, in her in her input here. Uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Thea, and then we can we can prepare the discussion. Uh, I'll also encourage the group again to uh, share both questions and. Some of you already shared um, uh, references and, and other uh, and other resources, so please continue to do that. I think this is uh, this is the right time to, to 
to be sharing those sorts of things. So over to you, Tia. Thanks, Jesper. <clears throat> and thanks, Miko and Albert, for, um, for your really interesting presentations. Um, I'm dialing in from Australia, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which I stand today, um, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I don't have slides, I'm just going to talk and I'm going to be quite brief so we can move to questions quite quickly. But I thought what I'd focus on today is um, three sort of really practical examples of our works in progress at the Centre for Public Impact, which I think demonstrate how we're working with partners around the world to encourage a more humble form of government. Because even though we don't always use the language of, of humility, I think a lot, there are really strong synergies between um, the, a lot of um, the, the language that, um, that Demos is using and also the language of experimentation is language that we use a lot as well. So some, some real sort of um, synergies there. So the first example that I thought I'd um, offer, I, and I'm offering three examples from our three different regions. So one from the US, one from Europe, and one from here in Australia, um, is some work that the US team has been doing on failure in government. And in 2019, our team worked with over 150 people in local governments across the US to test their comfort with the concept of failure. And unsurprisingly, what emerged was that they didn't love the word failure. So when people use the word failure, um, the most common responses for sort of word associations were words like loss shame and waste and actually four department leaders asked us to change the name of our program um, away from failing forward because they found that such an uncomfortable framing um, but we know that governments need to fail because failure is is inherent in any complex system and what's important then is to change the culture from sort of risk from seeing failure as something to be avoided to seeing failure as something that we need to learn from quickly and with intention. And so what we've done is off the back of that research, we've designed a program to work with government teams to understand what are the barriers, what makes failure, failing so hard, what is it about the word failure that means that you don't even want us to use it in our documents or our program, um, and how can we start to address that? And we're doing it in two ways. So we've got over the course of 12 months, a program that brings together people from um, different departments to work together to identify the internal cultural challenges to failing forward and to sort of design little experiments um, to um, or act action plans to break down those barriers. And then at the next um, at the next workshop, which comes three months later, to check in, see what's working, what's not working, whether it's changing the culture in the way that people are hoping, refining, adapting and continuing again. But one of the key um, sort of insights that emerged from the research and the conversations was that culture change around, lead, uh, around failure needs to start at the top. Without leaders who give permission space to fail, failure can't happen. And so there's also a series of executive masterclasses which are really focusing on that leadership cohort to work with them to understand what, what it's going to take for them to create cultures and permission for people who they work with and around to fail. And I think that, you know, the link here to humility is, is key because, um, part of the reason why governments don't like to talk about failure is because, as Miko was saying, they like to, to be seen to have all the answers and failure sits in tension with that. So I think that encouraging failure, what sits beneath that and what, what's required is a sense of humility on the part of the people involved. The next example that I thought I'd give um, is a piece of work that's been happening in the UK, which is around a regulator's community of practice. Um, and earlier this year, CPI together with Easier Inc joined forces to bring together national and local regulators and inspectors together with people who are subject to their inspection regimes and regulation regimes to have different kinds of conversations. The idea was that the community of practice would create a space for sharing learning, for developing new relationships, 
and for experimenting with new ways of working together. And so questions that they explored were things like, how can regulators and regulated organisations have more human relationships? How can we change the way inspections feel for, for people who are being regulated? And how can we create a dialogue so that inspections don't feel so hurtful and hard? And again, you know, the link here to humility is that in order for this community of practice to work, what we needed was regulators and people who are regulated to be open-minded enough to listen to perspectives that perhaps felt at odds or in tension with their own and curious enough to think about how hearing other people's perspectives might justify a change in their approach or behaviour. And it's a project that at its core was really about bringing together unlikely people um, to have different kinds of conversations and build relationships. And I was, um, I reread a quote the other day that sort of really has, um, you know, resonated in this context. And it's by Kanya Kramer and Sengi from the, the Water of Systems Change, where they say transforming a system is really about transforming the relationships between people who make up the system. Simply bringing people into relationship can create huge impact. And I think that was an, you know, that, that, that sort of community of practice was an expression of that sort of philosophy and approach. And then the last project that I'll just touch on really quickly is a project we've been doing here in Australia, very much a work in progress, um, with Dusseldorf Forum and Hands Up Mali. And what, what this project has been exploring is how can we use stories to more effectively communicate the impact of community-led systems change work to decision makers in government. And we've been listening to lots of people in communities and sort of expert storytellers as well to understand what are the barriers to telling stories and what are the barriers to having those stories heard. And at the essence of this um, project, we're, we're, the question was, how can we encourage government decision makers to value and understand and embrace new ways of learning about change. And you can see again, the link to humility because government to do this needs to step into the discomfort of engaging with stories of change which are non-linear and which are told by voices that are unfamiliar to them, voices that they're not used to hearing. So the question that we want to, want to sort of interrogate through this work is how does government relinquish control by stepping away from the language of numbers and quantitative data, which is familiar and comfortable and safe for them, and lean into what Hilary Cotton calls the baggy winding stories of people's lives. And we're gonna be releasing this report in a couple of weeks. So um, keep your eye out for that one. But as I say, very much a work in progress. And just to conclude, I think that what these three examples show is how we're, um, we at CPI are working with partners to explore what it takes to realise our vision for government, which is founded on three core beliefs. The first is that the world is complex and that most of the challenges that government engages with are complex challenges. The second is that human relationships matter a great deal. And the third is that pro progress is best made through um, experimentation and a process of continuous learning. Thanks, Jesper. Thanks, Tia, uh, and, and a nice way of, in a way, summarizing all of the three presentations, so certainly sort of in terms of principles uh, at the end here. Um, uh, yeah, much appreciated, all of you, um, kind of setting setting this scene and, and, and so many places to go uh, in terms of diving in, but, but I might take it um, selfishly uh, to a place that, I, that is close to uh, where I've been working a lot of my professional life, which is inside of government in a, in a lab that was trying to, in a way, you talk about legitimizing Albert, I think, trying to legitimize new ways of working and a new practice of policymaking. Um, what we found uh, or where we found ourselves was um, very much uh, not in, let's say, or most, well, most of the time, not in a strategically supported position 
Uh, so we did nice experiments, but it was sort of outside of strategic reforms, outside of core policy making. Um, so, so in, in a sense, um, we we were starting small and remaining small. Uh, to 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 use your word, Robert. Uh, so I want to pick up on a, on a, on a paradox there, because um, you say um, uh, I think this was your word. You, we need the expectations. So in a way, we need to embed. New, these experiments, new ways of trying out policies actually on what is prioritized because people need to learn and see the value of doing something different on something they actually care about. On the other hand, we are still trying things out. We're still trying new things, new assumptions out. And we wanna be starting small. Um, and then on the third element of that is we are relying on, as you were saying, Albert, I think, on you know experimental capabilities and capacity in government. So if we are actually trying stuff out on a on core uh, strat uh, strategic uh, areas, um, we need full not just the leadership support, but also the support of of uh, you know expertise within the government organizations. We an example of that would be our collaboration with the Canadian government a couple of years ago. That had a really ambitious process uh, initiative around policy entrepreneurs, where it actually was a prioritized project portfolio, but there was a lot of, let's say, bad press because they didn't deliver properly because they were actually trying out new things and new ways of doing things and so on. So all of that to say that there's a bit of a paradox there, um, I think, um, which I think all of you in a way touching, are touching on, but I don't know, how do you see it? Uh, how do we deal with that paradox? And what are some practical things that we should be doing? Nico, do you wanna give that a go? I'm putting you on the spot. Sure, it's a, it's a really intriguing topic and thanks thanks um, um, both Albert and Theo on, on, on great presentations. They made me think uh, a lot. On this question, I, I loved uh, Albert's uh, list on kind of the challenges or things that you need to take into account if you if you kind of want to practice experimentation in government. At least that's how I, I read the list. I, I would like to build on that and maybe connect to Jesper's question that what I've observed when having worked in few governments and trying to establish experimentation activities there um, is that what's really really important and connects to most of the points that Albert made is the institutional position of experimentation in government. So what are the linkages from your experimentation activities to, to different parts of the government? Now to make it more concrete it's typically like Jesper you described basically typically there is a unit uh, that is doing at least some part of the experimentation activities. Some are running them themselves, some are supporting them, some are building partnerships, but still that is the locus of experimentation in a way or another in government. Now, if you have this unit sitting in a line ministry um, and not very close to, let's say, a DG, but quite far from that, it immediately gives you a lot of uh, boundaries on what you can do. Even if you had the 10 best experimentation methodological people in the world sitting in your unit, you can't do certain kind of experiments. Um, for example, if you are, again, to put it really concrete, if you are advocating for a really, really transformative experiment, um, how do you launch that if you don't have the political support? And how do you get the political support if you are sitting very far from the government, even very far from your DG in your line ministry? Of course, it's possible to do that, um, but it's very, very unrealistic and do that repetitively, very, very difficult. But then again, uh, like I think it has been established pretty well in these discussions, there are many different useful ways of experimenting and that imaginary unit that I'm now speaking about might be doing really, really useful stuff in terms of, for example, validating which policies work, which services are useful, which are don't, and delivering that forward and then helping the government to get rid of bad policies, for example, or then um, um, delivering different kinds of methods for quickly testing out which innovations work or, or, or creating, making services more human-centric to the method of 
failure, uh, error, error and learning. Uh, so basically, they can do a lot of interesting stuff and useful stuff, but it's good to be explicit about it. It's quite unlikely that they do really, really transformative, big scale policies. So maybe this is the message that I would like people to elaborate on if, if there is experimentation activity ongoing or if one is establishing it, where to position it and what are the realistic functional links between that operation and rest of the uh, government operations. Thanks, Mika. Um, any other reflections here, Albert? Maybe I think, I mean, just very briefly, I think it's already talked for, for, for too long, but the on, on, on the question that uh, Miko was asking, I mean, I think there is no right and wrong answer. One of the, our, you know, one of the ways that I like to see this happening is through embedding. So we sometimes think of you know, people, mobility, people moving. So we sometimes think of these labs, whether it's externally like IGL, whether it's you know, the government lab or something, the citizen goes and jumps into a project. How can you actually build, I guess, a community of practice within government in the different levels and just embed people throughout it? This is, I mean, this is easier said than done. Uh, and partly that's, you know, I guess, maybe kind of reflecting on, on your, 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 your prior question, uh, Jasper, on, you know, what are, the, what are the different ingredients that are needed? How do you make all this happen? And it's so much of a combination of things that you need to happen in parallel that uh, well, it's funding, it's skills, it's creating the safety, which partly is normalizing, normalizing the idea, it's partly examples, that um, it's quite uh, it's quite a multi-pronged approach of you know, trying a lot of things at the same time, and hopefully, the, I guess, the souffle actually will, you know, will rise in the oven and you know, the culture will happen, but uh, often, more than not, it may not, and you know, it's just you know, trying it again. And I was just going to offer really quickly just an interesting model that I've seen recently in Victorian government, which is where I'm sort of, that's the state where I live in Australia, where um, one of the ways that they're trying to embed um, a sort of a, a new approach, it's, a, it's around place-based ways of working. Um, and what they've actually done is they've got champ, like a dedicated champion um, in each department who's responsible for sort of connecting up the place-based approach with their, you know, with their department. So I think that's actually another interesting model. Uh, I haven't seen it play out in any detail yet, but of that, that idea of how do you start to disseminate outwards um, from, from you know, the ideas that start in, in a particular team or in a particular you know, unit or hub or whatever it might be. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I noted the... Um the comment in the chat from Lena uh, as well, uh, which is which is a familiar strategy when it comes to um, uh, kind of touching on your earlier point about failure, uh, the, uh, about trying to be, in a sense, turn it out on its head, uh, sort of saying that, you know, um, governments are sort of, sort of failing already, um, uh, uh, or that's the one version, the other version is, what's the risk of not experimenting uh, and kind of going with that, uh, building the opportunity space through that sort of thing, but, but staying in the in the political with the political lens a, a little bit, uh, and sort of trying to to also bring some of the earlier presentations and, and sessions we've had in, in this uh, gathering into to the mix. Um, we uh, it's been very kind of clear that obviously the context has changed. Whether we talk about the kinds of problems and all the kinds of crises that we're facing, the, the speed of change and so on. Um, and you mentioned, Miko, uh, this uh, challenge of institutional short-termism uh, and, and the need for a long-term, to the Finnish government taking up this long-term focus, which I think is very exciting and encouraging. Um, uh, I, I wonder if we can sort of maybe re reflect a little bit more on, on that. Uh, since we are talking about the future of policy, it seems to me that one of the things that policy is increasingly facing uh, as, a, as a premise is to do inter intergenerational planning, um, given the, 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 the scale of the issues that we're dealing with and given how, well, given how we're 
should be held accountable to the to the public going forward. Uh, so, Mika, do you, do you want to expand on on yeah. that, uh, and particularly how we're dealing with this then in a, as you say, uh, an institutional short termism culture? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jesper. I think it's a super, very interesting topic and takes us also beyond the topic of experimentation, which I think is the idea also here, because we're talking about future of policy and policy making. I, for me, this is a really big question. I think now we are witnessing COP26, I think, which has been dubbed as the last chance of humanity, basically. And, and uh, basically, we are talking about quite big transformations that need to happen really quickly. Um, and we've seen in democratic countries and not even only in democratic countries, also in more authoritarian countries, you need to take care of legitimacy of your actions. And if you want to push through those transformations quickly, you need to take care that they are in a way or another fair, um, yeah, fair and sustainable. It's fair and sustainable at the same time. And that is just pretty difficult to do with our current governance systems. And, and um, you see in, for example, a few years ago in France, basically government raising the gasoline price quite quite little and you have yellow vests on the street for a couple of years and that's a reform, that's not a transformation. So now we're talking about big kind of big challenges that require long term attention and in democracies we have too little processes that would enable us to pay attention to long term and humble government was on, on is on from its small part is one effort to to try a new model uh, that would enable governments to kind of continue where the previous government was stayed and that's the idea that it's not only a technical policy making process but it actually would trigger a bit of a cultural shift within the parliament within the policy making uh, sorry decision making as well and in short, the idea is that with the team consensus in the beginning of that process, um, you require all the parties or majority of the parties to agree on, on a you know, more general level on a framework goal and then learn together and then require from politicians that they also share the limelight when success comes. And then it wouldn't be only your own project, it would be a shared project where still not one or two parties define the project, but were largely defined together and learned together about. This will not solve all our problems, but I think more and more this kind of, a, like you said, working progress pilots would be needed for us to be able to build, build uh, models that would actually enable us to uh, put in motion policies that uh, are not only uh, incremental, uh, transformative, but still require us quite a long time to uh, end up in a successful uh, end end result. I think this is it. I think for me, the future of democracy is a lot about the future of policy making, and that makes the question a little bit difficult. It, it, we've been talking about representativeness of democracy and that sort of things, which are important, but it's qualitatively different question. For me, it would be about enabling participation to policy making process and enabling long term mechanisms to be integrated to policy making. But that's really difficult because you need to think about the institutional setup, the interaction between the parliament and the government machinery, and then integrate continuous learning into the very core of government processes like policy making and budgeting. So that makes it intriguing and challenging. Just to jump in and offer sort of like a, a, a sort of a, an interesting example, which doesn't get to the heart of the, you know, the profound challenges that you've just identified, Miko, but I just love this example of something that a government is doing to, um, to help it think in more long term ways. It's the um, reverse mentorship um, in Taiwan that um, Audrey Tang um, has been a real sort of supporter of. So they've actually get young people to mentor ministers um, with the idea being that, you know, the young people bring a perspective around the future that people who are ministers may, may lack. And so it's this, you know, recognition that young people actually have a really important perspective to bring. And I love the language that they use around mentorship, you know, that's that they're seeing the young, these young people as being mentors to support governments to th and ministers particularly to think in more long-term ways. Maybe one yeah. more quick follow-up, sorry, from, from uh, uh, what you can see what we're, we're saying. 
uh, on. I do think there is a fundamental, uh, you know, challenge, and you know, your original question on kind of how to ensure, I guess, the democracies work. And part of that is, you know, embedding participation, but part of that is also embedding. I mean, we are not going to change incentives of politicians if we don't change incentives of voters. So ultimately, there is something about. I don't know the answer to that, but I would say there is. There is. I mean, there is. There is a, there is a fundamental uh, uh, challenge. You know, we are not going to see many change happen. We are not going to see consensus if voters don't reward consensus. If voters don't reward, uh, uh, you know, are open to failures. If voters, so so there is. So I think there is a fundamental uh, aspect of. Not only how we engage, you know, part, you know uh, particular voters to in, you know, in create more participatory processes, but also how do we make that the, yes, the you know the marginal voter, the deciding voter, the one that actually drives the incentives of policymakers and politicians, uh, is much more open to some of the ideas that that we've been uh, discussing uh, here. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have the answer to that small challenge. Yeah, thanks. Uh, although I, I wasn't expecting kind of clear answers, obviously, given the, given the upset of this discussion. Um, uh, I was, uh, there's, there's a little bit of time left. Uh, I did want to give the floor if you wanted, uh, Jane, you had a question for Thea um, that you may want to just quickly ask. Okay, I, I think I've got already the answer. Uh, okay. involving, in, involving young people, it was very great. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Okay, I missed that. Um, just want to make sure that we are, we are covering uh, all of that. So, um, maybe I'll then turn to uh, to the, the question that James put in the chat. So he reveals that he is a journalist. Uh, so he wants to make this about a personal story, obviously, um, uh, which I actually think is interesting, uh, given the three of you uh, working, um, you know, to support this agenda from the outside of government. So what would it take to uh, to get you into government to drive some of these agendas? Uh, that's that's sort of the personal question. Um, but also there's a general question there about what, where sort of the inside outside, um, you know, the, what's more strategic, uh, what's more helpful? Uh, obviously, you know, you, you're not allowed to say both and, but but answer the, uh, the, the personal question first and then you can take it from there. Probably, I, I, I imagine that um, for the three of us, one of the aspects is you know, where do you feel like you can have more impact from the inside or from the outside? Uh, and then that uh, follow and following from that, um, what are the needs, the things that you would need to make a change in state government, you know, the instruments in terms of flexibility, influence, buy in to be able to have that impact? Uh, as there is this thing, a big cost of this, so, so you know, the advantage of being government is the proximity to the day to day, and that's a channel of impact. The disadvantage is the much more kind of narrower focus, less flexibility, lower and fewer, less ability to actually try you know, different ways of having impact. Uh, you know, that's really stuck with, I mean, depending on where you end up. I mean, I guess there are examples here of people who basically, uh, I don't know, Brenton can, can, can share his experience of, of that. I was planning to get Brenton into the conversation, but uh, uh, Mika. Yeah, I see it as a very intriguing option actually to work inside a government. Um, <clears throat> I think what has been basically not stopping me, but not doing that, uh, steering me not to do that is that, of course, now I have opportunity to work with several governments at the same time, which I consider a big plus and also from the well impact perspective, but also personal learning experience. Or, um, so and so forth but actually maybe I want to also highlight that I don't see it that different always because some of the projects that we run we work pretty much in-house in, in the government of course I do realize that the roles and accountabilities are still different but we sometimes live pretty much day-to-day -day life with them so I don't consider it like black black or white but yeah uh, one intriguing option definitely for the future yeah, and for me, I mean, I worked in government for almost 10 years. Um, and I think that on reflection, like part of the issue for me is I am not a rule breaker. I'm a rule follower, uh, which is really annoying. 
um, and makes it really hard to be innovative in government. Everyone I speak to, all the greatest innovators in government talk about, you know, I proceed until apprehended. I, you know, I seek forgiveness, not permission. I'm not good at that. So for someone who is a rule follower, um, trying to make a difference from within government is really, really hard. And so that's why I've decided to step out for the time being, because I feel that um, my impact is greater from the outside at the moment. But I'm working on being, becoming a rule breaker. Brenton, maybe I need some shoots from you. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for sharing that, uh, all of you. And, and, and just a personal account on me, I actually am a part-time employee at, at the the Danish ministry currently um, to sort of take some of our own medicine here, uh, which is, a, I'd say I've been there a month um, and maybe some of my colleagues is, is on this call, I'm not, I'm not sure, but um, it, it's a humbling, speaking of humble, it's a humbling experience. Uh, so um, I, I can recommend that. Brenton, um, do you want to weigh in, just kind of share your experience uh, in, in that transition you've been making? Yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting one. Uh, good evening, everyone. And it's been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed um, listening in. Um, I mean, for those of you um, who are listening to the call who, who I don't know, I, I was working with States of Change and before that Nesta for the last nearly 10 years. Um, and three months ago, I rejoined the state government of South Australia um, as the head of strategy and policy in the Premier's department, so equivalent of the, the Prime Minister's department at the state level. Um, and at the moment, I'm, it's definitely a work in progress. Um, I'm in the middle of putting together a team which includes uh, skill sets in strategic foresight, uh, policy experimentation, uh, technology strategy, um, and new economic models. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll have some, some more to say on that when I can reveal the, the people who are joining the team. Um, but it's been a really interesting one because um, I had a moment with my with my boss a few days ago um, when he said this all looks all great and well and good but I just want three percent growth can you get me that <laughs> and I just kind of had a moment where I had to check myself and I I sort of was was thinking about all this amazing intricate kind of um, capabilities that we've been talking about and 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 realize that sometimes you, you actually have to ground it in in some people wanting some very simple things and and trying to sort of explain that while that might just be a very simple number, there's actually a lot of complexity behind that. And actually these skill sets will be really, really helpful <laughs> because to Miko's point, we don't really know. And actually to Albert's whole point, right? We don't really have the evidence about exactly what is going to get us there. So we're gonna to have to experiment our way there. And, and I was just really reminded by the, the sort of, I think the familiarity that you know the states of change community has with the way of this way of talking and actually sort of how um distant that can be from sort of every you know from a lot of people's um policy practice um so i, I guess i'm just reminded that there's a there's a lot more of sharing this ways of working more broadly and democratizing this that's still yet to come thanks Benton, for, for sharing that as well um so i'm reluctant to say that we are a we're out of, of time for this session. Um, I, I want, really want to thank all of you, uh, the speakers here, Albert, Miko, Thea, for, for sharing your work, your personal experiences, and your lessons learned. Uh, thank you so much for engaging also in the chat and the questions. Uh, as always, these sessions spark a lot of thoughtful, uh, thoughtful insights and, and references and, and examples and, and so on. So, so yeah, a true learning experience uh, once again. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and thanks for everyone's contributions to that. Um, yeah, and then as I say, um, maybe a final thanks, uh, uh, which I didn't mention in the beginning uh, to Citralat for supporting this gathering um, for the State to Change fellows and collaborators to make up these great panels and, and conversation groups uh, as we go along uh, to the final session of this afternoon. We'll be talking to Christian uh, Basin and, and to um, Dario Isaacson, the, the CEO of Binova. Uh, and we'll probably talk very much in length of this conversation, but sort of take it into the realm of missions. Uh, obviously, those two organizations are 
very much on the forefront of, of trying to embed that into uh, public uh, public operations uh, in, in different ways. Um, but that will be the final session, uh, so they will also be forced to reflect on what we've learned across all of the, the sessions, which you know is, is a big question, obviously. But uh, thank you for now, and and uh, yeah, just appreciate you all being here. Thank you.